Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, everybody, whenever you happen to be watching this. My name is Michael Bridgman, and I am your host of the WOW Expert Interview Series. So WOW stands for Words of Wisdom. This is a show where I reach out to some of the most fabulous business experts I can get my grubby hands on, and I bring them on to this interview show, and we explore what it means to be successful for them. What are some of the things that they've done to be at the most in the top part of their game and they bless us with their wisdom and with their expertise and they give us a window into how it is that they got what they got accomplished done so this is a show that's all about taking you to the next level it's all about exploring entrepreneurialism and it's all about exploring what it means to live your best self now before I dive into the interview itself I'd like to tell you a little bit about our phenomenal guest today so Deborah Kozowski is a lady that I have known for nearly two years now. She has the host of her own podcast called The Millionaire Women Show, which isn't just about women, by the way. She has been featured on Global Edmonton, CTV, and the Edmonton Journal. She has written, you guys, three best-selling phenomenal books. One is called GPS Your Life. The other one is The Entrepreneurial Mom's Guide to Growing a Business, Raising a Family, and Creating a Life that You Love. And her her most recent book, and uh, which is something I've read a little bit of, which is absolutely fabulous, I gotta finish it, is called Let's Be Curious. It's all about making sure that you're asking the right questions to get the answers that you really want to help live a fulfilled life. She's a keynote speaker, you guys. She has workshops, courses. She comes into businesses and she helps them go from struggling all the way to planning a massive amount of action. She is not only that, but she's also a beautiful philanthropist, a wonderful mother, a two-time triathlete, if I'm right, I think, Deborah, and she has developed an entire portfolio of incredible services for both business owners and people that is all designed around helping you live to the utmost helping you not only live a great life, but know that you're planning out exactly what you want, exactly what you're looking for, and being able to carve that beautiful vision of what you want out of your life into reality. So this woman has an incredible reach. She's done, she's just uh, blessed me with her wisdom many, many times over, and she gets to do that with you today. Can you please help me give a massive warm welcome to the WOW interview show, uh, Miss Deborah Kazowski. Thank you for joining us today, Deborah. Wow, I'm just going to need to bask in that a little bit longer. <laughs> it's pretty phenomenal intro. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And I'm excited to uh, share some of that wisdom with your guests so that they can live a life that's rich from the inside out. Yeah, yeah, totally. So Deborah, let's dive into this. Uh, we were talking just a little bit before we started the recording here about, about asking questions. And I think this is a great launching point here because this is your most recent book called Let's Be Curious. So um, we'll jump into how you got to where you are in just a sec, but, but frame us up a little bit about why you believe that questions are so darn important. Well, questions get you to exactly where you want to go. And I think so often I've run into people that they used to ask questions. And when you think about children, they're always asking, why, why, why? And I think at some point people have been shushed or told that they've asked dumb questions or not to ask stupid questions. And then suddenly, you know, they start retreating in themselves and not sharing and asking the questions that they need to, to get the answers that they want. Because truly, I believe that the solution that people seek is in the questions that you ask. And one of the things to remember when you're asking questions, you can have a starter question. It doesn't mean it's a one question and done. It, you need the right question to build off of so you can continually ask questions till you really dig down into exactly what you want. So when you have those, you can make better decisions. You can have better relationships by coming from a place of curiosity. So often we're making judgments, we're making assumptions. And I like to say that people are getting their best exercise from jumping to conclusions. Mm. So instead of doing that, ask the question that you really want to know. Totally, right? That's great. Because I, I think you're totally right, Deborah. Don't we get wrapped up in in this weird world of almost prejudging the fact that we even have a question, therefore we never ask it and we never progress from that point? Absolutely. We get stuck in this place of, you know, what are people gonna say about me? What are they gonna think of this question? Maybe this maybe this question's already been answered. 
Right. Well, if that's the case, we could just Google, Google the question and come up with the answer and not need to ask anybody anything. But here's my experience with working even in healthcare. You, you have to be careful where you get some of that information. And that's why I'm, I'm excited about talking about credibility and being online is that you want to get information from people that you know, like, and trust, but that knowledge, if it's healthcare, you want it to be evidence-based because some of you know these solutions that people are providing online can get you into trouble right and it could be a health risk it could be a number of other things so you want to be able to verify some of those resources so that you are not put in a position of risk and but you are at the same time getting credible information that you can launch and leap into your entrepreneurialism and into different realms absolutely okay perfect well i mean that's that gives us, a, I think, as as an audience, a really, really profound insight into what drove you to do what you're doing. So let's dive into that for a second, Deborah. Tell us a little bit about how it was that that someone who's who has a, a degree in nursing finds herself suddenly in the entrepreneurial world, doing business coaching and keynote speaking and developing courses and workshops. How did that leap happen? <laughs> Take us through that because I think that that's an important window into exactly what it is that makes Deborah Kozowski tick. Yeah. So there's a number of things, but one of the things when I think about my signature presence or um, where that golden thread, everyone has different events in their lives that have joined with a golden thread that bring you to where you are right now. And one of my earliest pivotal, pivotal moments was uh, when I was about eight, nine years old. Uh, we had a family, um, tr there was a tragic accident in my family, which involved five people, alcohol, and five deaths. Mm. And that, following that event, that Christmas, I had made a gift for one of the family members that was grieving the loss. And I thought I had the solution. I made this gift. It was, you know, when you're eight years old, anything that you make you think that you can fix everything right sure and I was waiting for this person to show up at Christmas dinner and I would come out and I'd say hey are they here yet are they here yet and they would say Deborah now is not the time to share your gifts I retreat into the bathroom and I'd be peeking behind the door and I'd hear whispering and chatter and I'd come out again and I said okay is he is he here yet is he here yet and they say no Deborah now is not the time to share your gifts so being the persistent child I was, I came out a third time. And the third time I came out and they're like, Deborah, now is not the time. And at that same time, the family member came in the door and I remember there being a bit of an argument or more of a discussion. And then they were told to sit down at the kitchen table. Here was their food, here was their drink, and it was time to move forward. And one of my greatest regrets is that I don't know if I ever actually gave that gift. Wow. So where it brings me to is, you know, in nursing, uh, my intent was fully to be a physician. And um, in university, I had done a little bit of an overloaded schedule, hit a little bit of a burnout, I'd probably say. And then I thought, okay, what's the closest thing to being in med, med school. And the closest thing I could think of at the time was to be a nurse. So okay. I finished my nursing degree. There was no jobs in Alberta. I went to a job fair in Orlando, Florida, I was offered a job on the spot. And then I worked in Orlando for a year and then flew to Toronto for a weekend, got a TN visa, travel nurse for three years before coming back to Canada. And at that time, coming back to Canada, I started learning more about real estate and sitting in different um, events. And I was like, I was at one event one time and I was like, wow, look at how he's captured everyone's attention and how mm -hmm. they shared their message. And yeah, I was yeah. like, I, I need to do that. I can do that. I know it. And at the time, I thought actually it was going to be for nursing. And it, and it wasn't. So and, you, sorry, you thought at the time that you'd be able to use this this gift of speaking to Yes, to yeah. And and then I realized how intrigued I was with business. I was invited to an eWomen Network networking event 
I had never been to a networking event. It was a day off and a, one of my friends who had a business said, Deb, I want you to come with me. I said, okay. So I'm sitting in this room with all these people connecting with each other, talking about business, talking about growth, talking about innovation and creativity. And I was like, okay, I need a slice of this world. <laughs> and then the, the speaker was talking about the little engine that could. The story that I haven't heard in so many years was talking about with businesses and you know, you know you can, you know you can, you, and it's that mantra. And I was like, walked out of there, I'm like, okay, I know I'm gonna be doing something, I just don't know what it is at this moment. Then I was at a real estate seminar again, and the guy was speaking and I looked at him and I'm like, okay, I need, I need to know how to do this. And I went up to the back at the end of the program and he looked at me, he goes, Deb, quit over analyzing. He goes, I will mentor you. Okay. And his name is Dan Locke. You, um, some of you may have seen some, he has a lot of posts on Instagram and things like that. But he was the first person to ever teach me about mentorship. Hmm. And um, I came to Vancouver, he had challenged me. He goes, what do you wanna do? I said, I think I'm gonna write a book. I have, again, not knowing where these ideas come from. Right, right, okay. Um, but I believe that any idea that comes to you is what you're meant to do. And he said, well, you need to just start interviewing these people. And at the time, and this is where this Millionaire Woman thread comes from, it ended up being the Millionaire Woman series. And he said, Deb, I want you to come to Vancouver in January. You're going to come present on stage. Tell everybody how you did this. And I interviewed not just five. I interviewed nine women and took it down to five, went on his stage, talked about how I did all this, but it was the first time I had flown myself, taken a taxi myself, stayed in a hotel myself. Really? And wow. all these huge things. And I remember the night before, a friend of mine messaging me, he goes, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm kind of tearful. I can't believe I'm actually going after this. It's actually happening. From that, I had people purchase my product and then one day I went for coffee with Charmaine Hammond who is a co-author of my first book, GPS, yep. Yep. Your Best Life. And we got into a four hour conversation that I got a phone call said, um, are you coming home for supper? <laughs> <laughs> it just led to a trajectory of connecting with new people and all these different events. And um, during my, like I got into leadership and management very early in my career, you know, coaching nurses, providing orientations, doing a lot of public speaking. And then I had the opportunity to get a certification in coaching because I had started my coaching business prior to that. And so that I could utilize it and leverage it in nursing and leadership. And then I also used it in my own business eventually, right? So it has just completely shifted gears to where I thought I was going to be. But what I know for sure from that sharing the gifts story is that my purpose is to help others ensure that they are sharing their gifts and I need to continue to share mine. But my main purpose is I cannot let you go with untapped potential. Wow. That's quite the calling, Deborah. Mm-hmm. Good for you. Wow. Thank that you. is, a, that is a, a, a beautiful journey in the sense that it's, it's so important for us to recognize as business people, as, as just people in general, that where we start doesn't always dictate where we end up in the sense that life happens and things shift and your desires and what it is that you believe in can evolve over time. And this trajectory of going into the health industry you know, it, it, you encountered specific things through there, but it led you to this totally different life. Would you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And I've, you know, I think that compassion and empathy is and vulnerability. All of those things tie into being an entrepreneur. Sure. Um, I think we need to appreciate where people are at because we are doing business with people and they're sitting in what they view as problems. We see them as an exciting opportunity to be innovative and creative. Mm -hmm. and that we can provide a solution to that because to be a successful entrepreneur you need to be solution focused not problem Absolutely. focused because what you focus on is exactly what you're going to get more of right yeah. and so, that's where that posing the best question comes into play right absolutely questions how do i solve this rather than why did this happen to me yes. right that's that's one of the questions that happens so often for people isn't it that they go 
they go, why did this happen to me? Rather than, okay, how do I move forward from this? How do I learn from it? How do I change this challenge into an opportunity? How do I do something with this? Mm -hmm. Their question quite often by instinct is, gosh, why did this happen to me? Why am I the one that got blanched with this? Why am I suffering, right? This is where I want people to shift that question. If you start focusing on a why question or a how question, you've just got yourself stuck. Mm. So if you can start saying to yourself, what ways can I move through this? What are the things I need to be doing? Who do I need to be? What do I need to do? What do I need to have? Because when you get in the why, Mm -hmm. it kind of gets into that why why is me. It kind of can pull you into a victim mode. Sure. So even if we're thinking, why did this happen? Shift the question to, okay, what what worked? What didn't work? What am I going to do differently? The what question is going to stimulate your files in your brain so okay let's let's look for the solution to the what okay. whereas why is almost like a blaming or getting people on the defensive why, why did you do that or how come that happened people get defensive and would you so, say Deborah that why focuses on the past rather than rather than focusing on what's happening in absolutely the you're hundred percent got that and the how people get stuck in well I don't know how And I know, even from my philanthropy, I didn't know how to feed a school. I didn't know how to get, you know, up to 5,000 shoe boxes for kids over 11 year plus period. I didn't know how to do that, but I did know how to ask questions. I did know how to ask for help. I did know how to share a vision. Mm -hmm. So you have to focus on what you can do versus what you think you can't do because that's where people the difference between those who are successful and those who are not successful is they don't see impossibility they see that i am possible and because i am possible i will figure out the solution great cool i love it deborah thank you so much uh so let's shift gears for for a second here because Um, We want to talk a little bit about how you've been able to build, going from the nursing industry and now into this business coaching industry and building courses and and writing books, Deborah, and doing all this amazing stuff that you've done. How did did you build the credibility and the trust that was necessary through, because you've done a wonderful job of creating an online presence. I mean, I watch a lot of your Facebook videos. They're fabulous, by the way. Thank you. Um, uh, you're welcome. And and I I know that building that that I should let me stop back for a second. I know that there is a massive audience for business owners online. You and I know that, right? Mm-hmm. And the trouble that we often face as business owners though is how do we cut through all of the distraction, all of the bells and whistles and fancy noise that's going on in an online world to actually get to having a real conversation with our clients? Because as you said entrepreneurialism is driven by finding solutions for people. That's what we want to do. We, as business owners, as entrepreneurs, we're, we're driven, and even as people all the time, we're driven to find a way of helping someone else solve a problem because I believe we're inherently good. And ultimately, we want to help people solve this problem and online gives us a massive opportunity to share that. So how do we cut through the noise? How do we cut through all the, and part of my language, all the bullshit that is out there that isn't true as you were referencing with the Googling your, your personal medical, you know, symptoms or whatever. How do we get through there and start creating that relationship with a client online so that they're, they're actually going, Oh, wow. What Michael is saying, what Deborah is saying, saying what Suzanne is saying, what, what, what Doug is saying, what these people are saying, resonates with me and I can feel the truth and authenticity to it. Yeah. So of course it's an ongoing process, okay. but one of the things is being really clear on your core values of what you want to represent. So for anyone, I would love for you to just write down who do you want to show up as and who do you want to be, what do you want to be known for? So who do you want to show up as mm-hmm. and what do you want to be known for? Those yeah. Are, those are two good questions. Okay. Yeah. Because when P- you, you want to align with who you want people to see you as and often they even have a better perspective of you um, than you anticipate or you know unless you're out of integrity Mm. so one of the things is with social media online platforms it's all about being social 
But we also know that there's times where you hear about people being scammed and all these different things. So people want to know that they can know, like, and trust you. No different than in-person networking, in-person connection. So knowing who you are and who you want to show up as on that online presence. What do I want people to say about me is really important. So first of all, you want them to get to know you because the digital marketing is like a s super speed highway. Yeah. And you're going super fast. Totally. So you want to be able to make that connection and really be that genuine personality where people can connect, connect with, right? So that no factor is let them get to know a little bit about who you are, what you stand for, what you believe in. And, um, you know, as you saw, Michael, I just re redesigned my website. So it'd be have a lot more visuals as well as a little bit more of my story. Mm -hmm. People learn so much about you and the story. What's relevant to me may not be relevant to you, but if we have a connection that you like to work with people who have philanthropy as part of their values, who have high standards as part of the values, if you are you know, driven to succeed like I am, we're great to work together. But if you go through those things and you're like, you know what, I'm not that driven. You know, she might be on me. <laughs> right. Then, then it's not a right fit. So that no part is to really find out, are we a right fit? That like factor is they need to know your personality online. Who are you? Because one of my greatest compliments, Michael, is going to a networking event and people either saying, you're just like you are online. Gosh, I certainly hope so. <laughs> or they say you're better even in person. Oh, there you go. That would be a nice one to get. That oh, you're even been... better in person than you were online. Yes. And it's the messaging as well, right? You want to have consistent messaging. I can't say enough about being consistent in your messaging. You know, um, there's been a number, number of people that I used to have in my feet. Suddenly they've disappeared. I've actually not blocked them. Maybe that energy, because the energy didn't go there anymore, is what they, they would do is they'd go on political rants. They'd go on this and that. And I was like, you know what? We have to pay attention to what influences us on a regular basis. And the last thing I want is someone's negativity affecting me when I'm reading posts. Mm. So to really think about when I post something, am I inspiring? Am I saying being congruent to the messaging that I want people to remember me for? Right. And if I've had a bad experience, is there a message that you're wanting me to know so I can have a good experience or how did you turn it around? Right? Those are the messages I'm okay with. But if you're going to just rant and be a victim, I don't want you in my feed. Right. right. So really paying attention. So we have that know, that like, letting your personality shine through. Yep. And then we have that trust part. That trust part is also built in not only by, for example, of me coming on your show, Michael. Sure. If there's that social proof, whether you be invited as a guest on other shows whether you have testimonials from your clients being shared on LinkedIn or someone's sharing an experience as a Google review of that they've worked with you. Right, right, right. All yeah. of these yeah. things create that social proof because online, no like and trust factor changes when you have a personal recommendation. Because when you think about some of the purchases you've made, chances are someone has bought something similar to what you're buying or you've been influenced to hear about what someone learned about a certain vehicle for example you know that that vehicle's a lemon this vehicle's that my friends bought this one and then you're like well they really liked it maybe it would work for me right right, then right. Yeah, you yeah. see people having that endorsement and that's really the online credibility has a lot of endorsement pieces and the biggest thing is consistent messaging so for two years before I decided to switch things up and do a little bit more randomness, every 7 a.m., every Monday, whether it was rain or shine, a holiday, there was one time actually I was in the hospital with my daughter in the emergency room. She was doing fine. We were just in a waiting game and we hadn't slept all night. And I still went out into the lobby of the hospital and did my 
um, Millionaire Woman Monday Minute. Wow. So, uh, so let's touch on that for a second because I think that's a that's a type of dedication and discipline to honing your trust factor that a lot of biz a lot of people don't they would never do that, right? They wouldn't get to that level of of commitment, Deborah. So that level of commitment to the discipline of showing up rhythmically. How much do you think that affected your trust factor and therefore your credibility factor in the eyes of your online audience? You know, I, I maybe haven't thought about it as much as you just mentioned, but it made me suddenly think of, you know, when you commit to being part of programs or you commit to doing something, it's all in, right? And I made a commitment to myself because we often cancel those commitments to ourselves quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Versus having a commitment to other people. Sure. So when I made the commitment that every Monday that I was going to do this, I made a commitment not only to myself, but I made a public commitment to all of my followers and those soon to be followers online that I would show up. And for some people, that's what got, got them going every Monday of the week, right? It got them jumping out of bed for those, you know, 104 weeks that I did that wow. straight until I went to random. Now they still look for them. They said, you know, those messages came at a perfect time for me. Interesting. So, you know so then Deborah, like if, if that's the case, right? I mean, what do you think, how do you think that, that helped you personally too, to have that type of discipline that was necessary? How do you think it affected your, your ability to, to know you could do it? Like you could, you could not only commit to it, but you could also have the discipline to see it through. How did that make you feel, you think? It's amazing. When you put in that commitment to knowing that you're making a difference, following through on your purpose, the outcomes, you know, I, I got detached from the outcome because I learned many years ago, there was one, I was working with a coach at one time and I had been doing public speaking and I always thought that if nobody came up to me after the talk, I must have failed. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't until that. the coach gave me a perspective that said, you know what, Deb, let's just average ballpark. But 50% of those people are introverts. They will never come up to you. Right, okay. The other 50%, they're extroverts. But because they don't know you or they're not jovial or whatever reason, or they came with someone, they're just gonna talk amongst themselves. I get great evaluations, but I still, I was like, how come nobody's coming up? Mm. And then she said, how many people do you need to come up to reinforce that you're good? And I was like, wow. And I said, well, all I need to do is ensure that I'm making a difference in one person because that ripple will be the difference. So the next time I went to a speaking engagement, I just totally went, you know, spoke from my heart and one girl came up at the end in just complete tears of how that message impacted her. And then I was like, that's it. That's all it takes is that one person. If I commit to my mission and what I'm supposed to do in life, that purpose for one person, or maybe the introvert who went home and maybe shared it with their family or wrote it in their journal, I could have made a big shift in somebody, but you're not always going to know about it. The other thing I learned is that there's some people who are external processors so they need to talk it out and as they talk it out they hear their answers and then there's other people who are internal processors who have to do some self-reflection journaling meditation whatever it is for them to really come to a place of understanding the message that was put in front of them hmm. very cool i love that and that gives us permission as people who want to reach out and connect with others to give them space for their own process, right? When we know- Absolutely. And it's really important because everybody gets to where they need to be at one point. One of my coaching clients, I just love her dearly for this, but um, what she did was she sent me a video one time that she was doing laundry and listening to one of my podcast, actually watching the YouTube video, but listening to the podcast. And um, she said, you know, Deb, I used to think that you know, sometimes we talked about things during our coaching session and, and I wasn't ready for them. But now I'm vacuuming the house and I realize I don't have aha moments. I have a Deborah moment. I have a moment where all of a sudden it clicks in that, ah, we talked about that. 
And now I'm ready to receive that message. That seed had been planted. Oh, I see Doug has had those moments. I <laughs> yeah, for sure. They're very powerful. And it's like, man, I wasn't ready. But now I hear her. I hear her voice telling me this is the conversation we had. But and what's powerful about that, Deborah, for us to recognize and understand is that building that that relationship because that's what we're really going at here right is how do you tap into this massive highway of potential business for you or for me or for anyone which is the online world but do so in a way that actually creates a relationship because you and i both know that people buy especially products like coaching and and any type of of self-assessment style product they have to buy it based on a relationship and mm -hmm. for the most part it as we said it's a noisy world so how that that ability to show up on a rhythmic basis right is got to be so important to uh how do i want to put this to build the opportunity to keep creating that relationship right because i mean deborah you've done 198 episodes of your podcast that's incredible yeah, we're coming right. on three years. There you go. I mean, that's amazing. So, so you've been able to develop all these. I mean, I'm in I'm in awe of how much discipline and consistency that that creates. But if you think about those clients that are perhaps listening to you online or anything else like that, can you go into it for for a second? How you think that affects them when they know that you rhythmically are there, that you're consistently showing up, that. You didn't just come up with a concept and you're explaining it and then you're gone three weeks or four weeks or six weeks or six months later that they can trust that you're there spreading what it is your message and 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 pushing forward with what you have to offer how do you think that affects the client on the other side even if they're brand new to you if they see your podcast tomorrow but they see this is the 199th podcast how do you think that affects the client well, one of the things that I think it does is demonstrates that I provide value. Value on a regular basis that I'm not here just, and you know, a lot of my platforms that I'm offering all this value is really no fee. Right. Right? I have right. articles on LinkedIn, which I have to catch up on my article writing, which feels kind of weird to not have been writing for a bit, but I've been busier in the other areas and sometimes you just got to shift with harmony. but and the podcasting you know and and opportunities of speaking and getting out in the community and doing things but i think what it shows is i demonstrate value giving without expecting something right away in return and i think there's many times that we suddenly have these pop-up of experts that show up and you know maybe everybody's a coach or everybody's a speaker and everybody's yeah. this and they're you know they're kind of i'll work with you for a short time take your money and run Whereas I still continue to follow up with clients that I've worked with maybe four or five, six, whatever years ago, because I truly want to know how they're doing. Mm. And I would love for them to continue to learn from me and, you know, take value from me because I, if I know if they're successful, I will be successful. That's awesome. That's, and, and, and a profound demonstration, I think for all of us, of what, living with a sense of abundance means mm -hmm. because a lot of people are terrified of giving away value without charging for it because they yes. feel like they're they're never going to get that time or that value back again somehow and yeah. i think i think we can both agree that that's that's looking at the world as a threatening space right and and i have to tell you when we talk about that threatening space and this was such a blessing to me recently one of my um i was an alumni coach for one of the students that was coming out of um, Royal Road University where we were doing coaching and she actually invited me and I it hasn't gone live yet but if you look up diversity at work with Andrea Jansen she um, just had interviewed me for her show and she said Deb you know when I was just getting started as a coach nobody would help me and you were the only one who came from a place of complete abundance you didn't see me as your competition right and I'm like wow you know, I was pretty amazed because to me, there's 7 billion people in this world. Yeah. I, I may not be the right fit and I can't serve all of them, right? And yeah. they may not want to be served by me yeah. or they might need a certain message from me so they can go on YouTube 
and learn from me. They can go on podcasts and learn from me. They can read articles, however they do. Doesn't mean that they're going to work for me. But if I've provided value in some way to make people realize that that abundance is everywhere. I only want to work with people who are the right fit. I'm not going to chase you down. I'm not going to say, oh, please work, work, work with me. I'm not, I don't do that. Right. If something resonates with you of something that I've said to you, I would love to work with you and see if we're the right fit. But I'm not going to come from a place thinking, oh my gosh, that person's going to steal my client. Mm -hmm. If they're meant for me, they will be for me. Beautiful. And so, I want to help as many people get to where they want to go. And look, she's championing me on yeah. her own podcast. So I'm not losing at all. No, you're gaining by it. I love it. So I want to I want to take us back to something that you said uh, a little bit ago, because it resonated with me, and and I'd like to just explore it for a second because I think it has an impact on on our topic for today. You said the word my signature presence, and I just I that I love that. So can you dive in for a second, Deborah, on what you mean by signature presence? So it was an exercise that we had to write up what was some defining moment in our life, that signature present, what has made me who I am today? Right. And one of it was that story about the gift. Sure. The other one that has taken me many years prior to sharing is that when I was almost finished my nursing degree, two weeks before I was done actually, I, I was working open heart recovery, all the bells and whistles and you know noises that you can hear in an ICU. Mm -hmm. uh, a patient came back from the OR, everybody was setting this patient up and all of a sudden the bells and whistles got louder as we were all working together. And then all of a sudden I heard someone say, we gotta crack his chest. We're, we can't do it here, we're going back to the OR. And he, as fast as he came in, as he was gone. Wow. And as a student, I was like, oh, all I could think of is, did I, did I do something? Right, because we're still that learner. We're not, haven't had that experience of that happen. I've never had anything happen like that in all of my training. Mm -hmm. So he was gone, I pulled up a stool, and I stared at the monitor. And when someone's on bypass, you, you only see the line. It's not a flat line, it's just that he's not on the rhythm strip. And I, I sat there for two hours, just staring at the screen wow. thinking, will I see that heartbeat? Is something that we did forced him to go back? And then one a little while longer, my preceptor came and touched me on the shoulder. She's like, Debbie, you need to go home. And I'm like, I'm not going until I, I find out this outcome. And they're like, you need to go home. I'm going home. There's nobody here to supervise you anymore. And I said, okay. And here I'm like two weeks from finishing. Mm -hmm. I go home. I put my pajamas on, put the blanket over my head, and I cried myself to sleep. About noon the next day, my instructor called. And she said, how are you doing, Deb? And I said, you know, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm meant to do this. And she said, Deb, you only have two weeks left. You're graduating with distinction. Right. This is life and death situations happen in healthcare. You're doing well. And I couldn't hear those words. I, I couldn't hear those words because I thought, how am I doing well when someone had died? She had told me he had died and I had completely lost focus. Hmm. And then about an hour later, my preceptor called and she said, Deb, I went and talked to the doctors. I went and, and there's nothing we could have done. It was that with or without this surgery, this gentleman would have passed away. But for over 20 years, I carried that with me. I didn't want anyone to know the story mm. because I still took responsibility. And just like I do for my clients or that m Monday morning minute, I think some of that comes from that. I take responsibility 100% for anything I put out in the world. And this time I couldn't do anything. 
Mm-hmm. And but what I took away from that, and now that I share that message with people, is no matter where you are in your business, and if I work with you, I'm not going to give up on you. If we're a right fit, I am here to help support you until we figure it out. Mm-hmm. Right? And I think that's probably where most of that drive comes from, Michael, because now I, I have dedicated in my life to ensuring that the people are sharing those gifts <laughs> and knowing that they can't give up. Because as you've learned in my story, I obviously graduated. Mm-hmm. Distinction. I worked in healthcare, I traveled nurse throughout the US. And I came back to Canada and I worked in leadership and management. So I didn't quit. And it takes a lot to not quit when you have something so devastating happen in front of you. Yeah, for sure. That's got to be, I can't, I mean, I can't really imagine what that process would be like to go through, but it's, it's amazing to, to see how it's influenced you, Deborah, and how it's made how it's given you such power it has it has but I tell you um, you know when I started sharing in the business world people are like well what is something that you can share vulnerable and I was like I'm not sharing that story what would will be one story that makes you really emotional and I said yeah. oh not that one they're like yes that one <laughs> that's the one yeah and it was very challenging for me to be able to share that without feeling shame, without feeling that blame part. But I also have to remember that I'm not God, I'm not the universe, and I didn't have control over the outcomes. But when it comes to business, I've also, and coaching, I've learned that you need to put in the work, you need to put in all the efforts, and you need to still be able to trust a process, but detach from the outcome because the outcome is exactly what it needs to be. Mm. Okay. And you know, people are like, oh my gosh, but I might fail. That's okay. There's something in that failure that you are meant to learn. So if we start shifting our thing as seeing that we failed to really shifting our focus to say, okay, let's shift the perspective. Cause like a kaleidoscope, if we shift it, we see things differently. Right. So I encourage people by asking questions, but to start shifting your perspective of what can I learn from this situation that can propel me forward. And Marshall Goldsmith talks about failing forward. So instead of beating yourself up and staying in that space of scarcity, negativity, and blame, it's important for us to say, okay, what can I take from this? How am I going to be better, a better version of myself the next time I show up? Right. That's what's most important. I love it. I absolutely love it. And and in relation to our topic, Deborah, I think it's, I, I, I from an outside perspective for you, it's I think it's one of the things that makes your online presence so valuable and so powerful is, is your honesty and is your authenticity with some of the stories that you share and vulnerable stories like that one so then just to to recap for a moment here so when we're talking about building that level of trust and credibility to create a relationship so that we can help someone online on this super highway of potential clientele right then we're talking about the idea of consistency of authenticity Mm -hmm. and of vulnerability really is what some of the things that i'm really hearing from you would i be right there Yes, and it takes courage. It takes courage to show up and be yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that should be easy. But what I find is so many people are caught up in the comparison trap or, you know, worried about judgment. And one of the most game-changing books in my life when it comes to that area is The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. The Four Agreements. The Four Agreements. Okay. And the one agreement that really spoke to me the most out of the four is not to take anything personally Hmm. whether it be positive or negative it is still someone else's perspective their lens view of the world based on their own experiences education whatever has made them who they are so i can come in and say oh you know what michael you look really good in blue 
Well, thank you. Next Debbie. person who can come by and they say, you know what, Michael, I think you need to switch it up because it's really <laughs> not bringing out your eyes, right? What do we want to hang on to? We want to always hang on to the great stuff. And the bad stuff, even a poor evaluation, we could have 300 fantastic evaluations. We get one bad one, where are we looking? We're looking at the poor one. Another mentor of mine said, take, take the lowest one, take the highest one and throw them out. Right. Because the true picture is, and I'm talking from awareness and insight, because you know there are some people who do, do lack awareness and do lack insight into their own person. But for the most part, most people do have an awareness of themselves, mm -hmm. right? I truly believe that. Mm -hmm. But when you start thinking about, okay, thank you for your opinion, that's interesting. And you're like, all that matters is what I think. That's the game changer. The game changer is knowing what you are capable of and what you believe in. Because we can get sidetracked so easily on what other people are saying. We can have comments on Facebook. Someone will say something great. Someone will say, you know what? You need to lose weight or you need to do this. You need to do that. And I'm like, but who am I spending my time with? Am I spending my time with people who might have been in a fight with someone before they've entered? They might have some turmoil going on in their life sure. because whatever's influencing them is how they're thinking and feeling and their action was to put a nasty comment. Right, they're dragging that into what it is that they're saying. Right, they're, so yeah. those comments say more about those people than they do about me, you, Doug, Suzanne, Francine. They say more about those people than they do about us because our response is, you know, thank you for sharing your opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I just absolutely love it, Deborah. So I, I wanna open it up here to to some questions. Are you cool with answering a few uh, a few questions from the group here if they put it in the chat box? Absolutely. Let okay, me know so, what they are. Yeah, we'll open it up. Uh, so if anybody has any questions regarding today's topic, so that idea of, of building yourself um, relationships online so that you can grow your presence and grow your influence uh, by using trust and credibility through relationship building and everything else, then let's hear them. Okay, so, so Doug's got a couple of quick questions. So okay. go ahead, Doug, why don't you unmute yourself if you can, and you can go ahead and ask your questions of our guest, Debra. So the first question that I have uh, has to do with, um, you were talking about credibility, especially in the medical field, and people post stuff on Facebook all the time, and how do you know what's real and what's not, and you know, that kind of thing. Um, I spend a lot of time reading studies, and I know that, that statistics can be manipulated so if I have a certain point of view that I want to come out I can use the study and manipulate that that study so that it reflects the point of view that I want what's the best way to cut through that bullshit and and find the truth well one of the things if, if we're talking specifically healthcare is that what you're referring to specifically or um, just in general I mean I'm, I'm a personal trainer so I spend a lot of time reading stuff about healthcare and nutrition and that kind of stuff yeah. but I mean I see it all the time all kinds of stuff right so one of the things is you know I like to look at credentials credentials you know do they get results always not necessarily depending on the the world view right but if they have an education in that area, that's helpful. The other part is, are they in, who are they endorsed by? Because I know endorsements, you know, there can be a lot of money thrown around for endorsements, but do, do they stand by their value? Is what they're having as their endorsements match core values? The other thing is best practice. What is current best practice? And are they aligned with current best practices? That would help me really cut through because if there's this one of, you know, you know, that quick fix, we know that to be truly successful, we need to have sustainability. Sustainability doesn't come from quick fixes. Right. Right. So I'd be paying attention to their copy as well on their websites and in their offers, you know, because they can jazz it up. But there's a certain point that you can be reading through copy to see if someone's being truthful or not. Cool. Love it. Thank you, Deborah. Perfect. You're and welcome. Doug, you had one more question. And then my second question is, what what are some of the things that a person should look for in a mentor? Because, I mean, I just recently started um, following Dan Locke and, and I got his, one of his books and 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I think he's great. Um, before that, uh, Tony Robbins. I mean, I, I really kind of like him. Uh, I mean, I have a few, um, but there's just so many people who are business mentors out there. Uh, what are some of the things that a person should look for to know who they should be working with? Okay, so when you're thinking about a mentor, if you're wanting it specifically for your personal training business or for anyone, if you're looking for some someone even just for your life holistically, I want you to look at your life in all the different areas. So it could be finances, it could be business, it could be relationships, it could be recreational, it could be for entertainment. So if you're looking at that spectrum, because I know that I've had coaches for different things. So if I wanted to work on my finances, I would have a financial coach. If I wanted a relationship, I'd work with relationship coach or listen to a relationship podcast. So really thinking about what, what areas do you want the mentor in? Like for speaking on stage, I have a mentor for helping me with storytelling, but I have another mentor to help me with vocals and speeches. Hmm. Another one to help me with writing content right so think about what are you needing the mentorship in and then looking about is it that I want to learn from them do I want to listen to them do I want to coach with them because mentorship can come in many different forms you know I have lots of influences that I read their book but I've never met them or if I have a I might have interviewed them for the podcast but I I haven't most of them I've, I've read all their books before they've been on my show um, Sometimes I've read an article that's triggered me to contact them and then I need to read their book after and build the conversation. But the thing is, think about where you want the mentorship in. Where do you feel that you were going to get the greatest value? And that and value being your time, your money, and your resources, that energy piece. Don't take for granted mm-hmm. the time and energy piece. Right. You know, people often think that mentorship or coaching, you know, it's all about that money piece, but you need to have a real genuine connection with whoever you're working with. Who resonates with you the most? Maybe pick three, maybe five people to learn from at a certain period of time. I wouldn't get too many, depending on the areas that you're working on, even three is good. Learn from them mm-hmm. for a while. And here's the thing. I have friends, we all talk about reading books and we talk about doing all this stuff. You can read and learn as much as you want, but if you're not implementing the learnings that you were taught, it's a wasted, it's wasted knowledge and there's no power without implementation. Great. I love it, Deborah. Thank you so much. And I think that that's really important that, that for anybody watching this is that when you choose your mentors, choose them for a specific space in your life, as you said, because not every mentor is good at everything. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, I think that it's really important that we go, this is someone who's achieved a lot of what I would love to achieve or is doing something in the realm of that specific concept that I would love to do. Therefore look to have mentorship by that person. You know what I mean? Like they are successful financially. So are they selling a, a financial mentorship product? If they're successful financially, well, then I would take a look at that product. Otherwise you're getting this bland generic mentorship. That's, that's not necessarily serving a purpose. Right. So I hope that answered um, it for you, Doug. So I've got a, a question here from Francine. You so did, all thank you very me. much. Yeah. Uh, Francine says, do you think we need to use Facebook for social media as a business, especially since the platform is not necessarily up to par regarding moral views, etc." Well, I saw recently that there's Facebook dating now, so anything's possible, I guess. But I do believe that if you do run a business, you should have a business Facebook page and you know to tailor your content to that page as well as leveraging linkedin because truly linkedin is where the majority of business people do hang out however facebook does have a presence even we're seeing more and more with instagram so for example personal trainers i i follow a number of them who doing online workout like doing a workout in their instagram video saying this is the workout of the day and they have you know five short workouts and they demonstrate them doing the exercise right right so depending on your industry and but it, what's most important is are you hanging out where your avatar is 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 that where your platform is located like if they're not on facebook don't be on facebook with your business right you want to be very targeted again so you're getting the greatest return on your investment 
absolutely. And and the other thing to to tag onto what Deborah's saying there, Francine, is that different social media platforms provide different kinds of value too. Facebook's great for for writing. LinkedIn is great, really good for writing. Uh, if you're a great writer, those are great places to put articles, like Deborah was referencing. Instagram is a hugely visual medium, so if you've got a product that's that has great visuals, right, that that does great creative work visually speaking, then Instagram is a good place to post that stuff because it is a visual platform. So I think that they get to depends. know your personality through your posts. That's true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, you guys? Any other questions about uh, this particular topic? before I, I get to my final couple of questions here, Deborah. Okay. Looks like we've got we've got most of the questions out of the way here, so that's great. Uh, so first off, before I, before I ask you my final big impact question here, uh, where can people find you? So, I mean, you've got three books out there, so I'm sure they can find those on Amazon, I imagine. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, uh, but where else can, can we find Deborah Kozowski? Where is she hanging out? Where can we contact her? Well, you can see me hanging out at www.debrakazowski.com. It just got a whole re facelift of my website. It's beautiful. Um, I have an amazing team that was behind that. And my it podcast. It's a very nice looking website. I'll give you that, Deborah. It looks very Thank nice. you. Thank you. And my podcast, The Millionaire Woman Show. And we talk about leadership, business, and human potential. So I have a variety of guests, and sometimes there's just a message from me to um, really bring some attention and give you some tips and strategies so that you can live your life truly rich from the inside out. And that's where the millionaire part comes from. Um, and it serves both men and women. Mm -hmm. And my books, they're on Barnes and Noble, they're on Amazon, they're mm -hmm. on Indigo, they're in some local bookstores here in Alberta. Um, but otherwise, most people find them online. Beautiful, perfect, okay. And YouTube. Yeah. What's that? And YouTube. YouTube. You can go to YouTube because my um, podcasts are not only on audio for all podcast players, but I do record them on video so you can see me talking with the guests as well. Very cool. Okay. And, uh, and last but not least, um, I want to do, I want to ask you two quick questions here. One is, can you give us a, a brief summary of what the shoebox campaign is all about and pancake breakfast? Because I read a little bit about it. I'm kind of fascinated by it. And I think it would, uh, I think we, we, we'd like to know a little bit more about what that actually is. Sure. Sure. So many years ago, I had a bucket list item, so, you know, after reading, you know, I think it was Jack Canfield's book and then watching Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson in the bucket list movie. And I made a list that all the things I wanted to do. And one of the things on that list was I wanted to watch a child open my shoe box. Many years ago, growing up, I, our family would put together shoe boxes and send them to the orphanages in Ukraine. Wow. And my children were small at the time I made the list. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to be going to Ukraine anytime soon. But then I was at church one day and I was looking at the bulletin and they were talking about this school that needed some help. There was no community support. And I actually knew the vice principal. So I picked up the phone and I said, hey, I have this thing on my bucket list about wanting to watch a child open my box. How many students do you have in your school? And he's like, 125. I'm like, cool. I said, what do you think about us surprising the kids, each with their own special gift? He's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. I'm like, okay. So I sent an email out to coworkers, family, friends, and we collected 125 boxes that all had seven mandatory items and then the rest they could top up to the top. Hmm. And so there was toothpaste, toothbrush, socks, knits, tubes, a granola bar and a juice box. And the rest was Hot Wheel cars, dolls, whatever, whatever they could put in the box for a child of a certain grade. And what we did is we covered all of the presents with tarps, put them against the stage. We had a whole school sitting in front of us and Santa came in and sang, you know, we sang some Christmas carols and then it just kind of flowed organically that we had a ho 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 contest for the class to get their gift. <laughs> and then we did the massive big give. We counted to three after the, all the presents were distributed and they all opened it at the same time. Awesome. So there was tears. <laughs> all the adults were in tears. The kids were screaming with pure joy. I got to watch not just one, but 125 kids' eyes light up. 
-hmm. from opening this gift and getting excited about a toothbrush. And, you know, we were like, we were, you know, it was a lower income school. And when I say lower income, often more immigrant population um, and, and low income in the area. But no one gets left out. There's no differentiation. Everyone is the same. The following year, I was like, that was so cool. Even though I crossed it off the list, I think I'd like to do it again. It just, <laughs> it felt so good. So this time I phoned him and I said, well, because I know you, can we do it again? And he said, Deb, I have one request. I said, what's that? He goes, can you feed us? Whoa. And I was like, oh, I don't know how to do that in my head. Yeah. And I'm like, all I saw in that moment was a brief flash of a child looking up with me with a plate that said, feed me. And I was like, well, how do you say no to that? <laughs> right. I was like, I'll figure it out. I'll just figure it out. I figure out other things. I'll figure this out. Right. So again, I get off, I email all family and friends and then everything was like it was orchestrated, ran smoothly. And then we've continued to do it and we're coming into our 12th year. Wow. 12 years do, and it's been the same school the whole time? No, we've rotated. We've um, done it completely by principal referral. Um, um, volunteers, I don't even recruit volunteers. They all come <laughs> or they've been a part of it in the past and they've brought family members and friends. And we usually end up with another whole family of, um, I like to call them our Christmas family, spirit of Christmas family. And we started feeding them is just and the person who supplied the pancakes they came into my life through triathlon so it was very interesting how everything that you do kind of all ties together very cool that's fabulous so deborah i'll, I'll put you on the spot here for a moment if if there's the opportunity to come back and 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 do another show with us because it's just been fabulous today would you be open to coming on and doing another another show with us sometime in the future oh for sure i would yeah. love to okay very cool and love so so as I wrap things up here, we talked about building that trust. We talked about building that credibility with your online audience so that in the end, you as the entrepreneur, as the business owner, as the person who wants to make an impact in people's lives, you've got a trusting relationship that you're building with these people. And that takes discipline, that takes consistency, it takes a valuable message. And as, as it was put here, it takes your signature presence. What is it that makes you unique? What is it that makes you resonate in a different way than everybody else on the planet? You have a unique, a completely unique fingertip, and that means, and that fingerprint, and that means, you guys, that your soul is unique. The way you resonate with the world is unique. So discover, uncover that, that signature presence, and you find it, as Deborah was alluding to, through exploring your personal story and that legend that is you. So please go ahead and do that. Now, Deborah, before we, we end the recording here, and then before we say goodbye after that, I just want to ask you, if Deborah Kozowski International reaches its pinnacle, reaches its peak, its zenith of what you want to accomplish, what type of impact do you want to have your business have on the What I want the impact to be is for every single person, no matter if you have a health issue or whatever's going on for you in your world, knowing that you are not your circumstance and that if every single person that I reach Let's say I reach a million people. Hopefully we'll bust beyond that. Because if there's 7 billion, I want the odds to be higher. <laughs> but if I have encouraged you to step in to your purpose, step into the skin you're meant to be and into your full potential, imagine if every single person did that to truly live out who they're meant to be, sharing their strengths with the world versus focusing on any weakness. Because we don't see it, only you do then I have truly helped change the world. And I am one person. Beautiful. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. It's been a total honor to have you on uh, on my show today, the WOW interview series. So I want to thank you very much for that. We'll cap off the recording here, everybody. Uh, but a massive thank you from myself to you, Deborah, for being so fabulous and being on our show today. Thank you to everyone for joining us.